Go to chapter 3. Just two statements about Joshua 3 and Joshua 4. Maybe one statement each. In Joshua chapter 3, we saw Israel finally cross the Jordan River. They crossed over on dry ground by a miracle of God, a miracle of Yahweh to dry up the Jordan River. And then after that, in Joshua chapter 4, we saw stone memorials. We saw a stone memorial set up of 12 stones. And God gave the reason for instructing Israel to set up those 12 stones. He said, so that your children and your children's children, so the generation of Jews that will come after you will ask, what are these stones about? Why are these stones in this, in this circle? And you can answer them. This is when Yahweh safely had Israel cross the River Jordan. Uh, not unusual, the stones in a circle. Uh, the more I think about what's going on here, the more I, I look at the word Gilgal, the more I understand the idea of, a, of Gilgal meaning ring or circle, the more I think these stones were in a ring. And it's interesting that on through history, there are circular rings of stones around the world. Uh, I don't know if any of you, I know Jerry has traveled to, the, to Britain, to Great Britain or to Ireland or to Scotland, but these stones that you see are uh, all different settings of stones in round circles. Uh, they're all around the world, but especially on the British Isles for some reason. This is what was going on in the days of Joshua. I wonder if these are a, a, a nod to the biblical tradition of, of stones in a ring. But this is what was going on when Joshua had those men pick up those 12 stones from the riverbed of the Jordan River and bring them out to Gilgal and, sit, and set them up as a memorial. Uh, another thing I'd like to say about the stones is if you ever saw stones in that position, you'd ask what was going on. It's obvious that that's not a natural thing right there. It's obvious that that's not uh, the way God made those stones and put them in its circle. It's obvious that someone, some man, gathered those stones and set them up like that as a memorial. So... Remember that as we go through these things, that they have a memorial there. That's what we saw in Genesis or in Joshua chapter 4 as they crossed the river. I want you to remember too, as we go into Joshua chapter 4, in what fashion the men of Israel crossed the river. They weren't rejoicing. They weren't uh, uh, wearing casual clothing because it was a day at the beach, a free time. That wasn't the, the mindset with which the Israelis crossed the dry riverbed that day. As a matter of fact, the opposite was true. They were ready for battle. Look what it said in Joshua chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. I'm setting this up so we can see what God does in Joshua chapter 5. But in Joshua 4, verse 12, concerning how the men were prepared when they crossed the river, it says the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh crossed over in battle array before the sons of Israel, just as Moses had spoken to them, about 40,000 from these two and a half tribes, about 40,000 equipped for war. They didn't have their, their wagons behind them and all their implements on the wagon. They were carrying their implements. They were ready for a fight. Remember, only God knows how Jericho is going to fall. The men of Israel don't know that the men of Jericho aren't going to attack them on this day as they see them crossing the river. What I'm telling you is Israel was ready for a fight. 40,000 equipped for war crossed for battle. They crossed for battle before the Lord to the desert plains of Jericho. Now this place, Gilgal, is about two miles from Jericho. They were very, very close. Jericho's up on a bluff. So from the walls of Jericho, you could easily see two million Jews. And that's where we are as we move into Joshua chapter 5. Men ready for battle have just crossed the river and it says in Joshua chapter 5, verse 1, Now it came about when all the kings of the Amorites, who were beyond the Jordan to the, to the west, and all the kings of the Canaanites, 
who were by the sea, when they heard how Yahweh had dried up the waters of the Jordan before the sons of Israel until they had crossed, their hearts melted, and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the sons of Israel. So the Amorites here represent all the peoples in the land of Canaan that live inland. All the inland dwellers. The Canaanites represent the people that live along the Mediterranean coast, those that live along the sea or by the sea. So by God using the kings of the Amorites and the kings of the Canaanites, it's a merism. What he's saying that it, everybody in the land, every king in the land, everybody in the land was terrified. Their hearts melted and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the sons of Israel. They were not prepared for battle. They didn't want to go into battle with these Jews. They didn't want to go into battle with the God of Israel, Yahweh, because they'd seen what He had just done when, they, when He dried up that river for them. So together, everybody in the land, those inland and those along the coast, together they were terrified of Israel and mostly of Israel's God, Yahweh, and His strength or His omnipotence. They knew who this God was and they had just witnessed a miracle the drying of the Jordan River. Now you would think as a military general named Joshua, as a leader of men preparing men to go into battle, you would think this is great news that the men of the land, even their kings, were terrified of them and their God Yahweh. Now is the time to attack that would have been the mindset of any general who's ever led men into battle. When the enemy is terrified, go attack. But what do we read in the Bible in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 9? We're about to see a great shift here in tactic. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and 9, God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts. So here's Joshua ready to lead a military charge into Jericho, and God says, slow down. I'll lead. You follow. My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways. Just because it may look like the right time, Josh, not the right time. I'll say when the right time is. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. It reminds me of this proverb a lot of us hold near to our hearts. In Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord. It doesn't say trust in your own thoughts. It actually, it says the opposite. Trust in Yahweh with all your heart and do not lean on your own understandings. Instead of leaning on your own understanding of the circumstance, trust Yahweh in this circumstance and everyone. Whether the circumstance is bad, trust Yahweh. Whether the circumstance looks good, trust God. Don't lean on your own understandings because God's thoughts are not your thoughts and His ways are not your ways or mine. So in Proverbs, Solomon says, trust in the Lord, not in yourself. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understandings. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. Recognize that He is sovereign. Recognize that He has the right to rule, not you. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. So with this in mind, as the ruler Joshua leads his army across the river, ready for battle with 40,000 men, at least 40,000 men, it just numbers the men of the tribes of Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh. There were, there were set nine and a half other tribes that would have had men ready for war also. But we're, co we're told of 40,000 of them from these three tribes. So as Joshua uh, looks over the scene, I can imagine Joshua was ready to go and take Jericho. But God has shown us in the Bible that His ways are not our ways. So what was God's plan? Trust in the Lord. Lean on Him. Acknowledge His plan first, not your own understanding. So what was God's plan? And this is what we'll see in Joshua chapter 5. We're going to see that God's plan involved two spiritual events. 
But God, it's time to fight. The men are weak. Our enemies are weak and faltering. We can take them today. God says, spiritual events first. Let me lead. Two spiritual events, and the first one we'll come up to, God says, circumcise all the sons of Israel born in the wilderness over the past 40 years. <clears throat> Think about what's being done here to men that are ready to fight when God says, circumcise them in the foreskin of their flesh. Now we have to ask a question, and we'll answer it more as we go through, but why... Why weren't they circumcised already? They've been in the wilderness for 40 years. Why weren't they circumcised on the eighth day of their life? Because look what it says in Leviticus chapter 12, verse 2 concerning Israel. Moses, God gave Moses this law. Moses shared all these facts with the Levitical priests and with the people of Israel. So why didn't they do it? In Leviticus 12, it says, Speak to the sons of Israel. When a woman gives birth and bears a male child... Then she shall be unclean for seven days, as in the days of her menstruation she shall be unclean. So when a woman births a child for seven days, she is ceremonially unclean, ceremonially unclean. The same is for her menstrual cycle. According to the Word of God, for those days of her cycle, she was unclean, unable to come into the presence of God in, at the uh, tabernacle. And this is what the law says. After her seven days of uncleanness are finished, on the eighth day, she's to bring the male son and the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. So the question, let that hover in your head for a minute. Why weren't they already circumcised? Any thoughts? Who were their fathers, the leaders of the Jewish homes? Lousy spiritual men, saved, without question. They put the blood on the doorposts and the lentils. That's the generation, the first generation of men who slaughtered the Passover lamb. Saved, lousy spiritual leaders. Those men were indifferent to God. Those were the men who heard the, the ten spies say the people in the land are too strong, the cities are too fortified. Those are the people that shrunk back in fear. They were simply indifferent to the rules of God, the sovereignty of God, the leadership of God, the abilities of God to take and kill all the people in the land of Canaan and give Israel the land. They knew the other thing about this particular generation is they knew they were all sentenced to die. They had been given a death sentence. For some of them, that death sentence took 40 years. For others, I'm sure they died the next day. So they were indifferent to the ways of God by this. There wasn't a great spiritual relationship between Yahweh and the Israelites over this 40-year period. It wasn't a year of great spiritual growth or, or a season of great spiritual growth because the men of the families were lousy spiritual leaders. Again, having been sentenced to die in the wilderness over the next 40 years, they weren't very interested in the things of God. So what God recognizes in the second generation is that these men are not circumcised and they will be circumcised before I lead them into any battle. There is a spiritual condition, a spiritual truth that is undone, and we're going to fix that first. It's time for renewal. This is about renewal of Israel. It's time for renewal of the, of the covenant relationship. The relationship with Yahweh always comes first. It's the most important aspect of our lives. And it was to Israel, and God made sure they knew it. God understood that Jericho and all the kings of the land were terrified. But God also understood that He was going to lead these men in a certain way, and spiritual came first. The second thing that we'll see in Joshua chapter 5 is that Israel will celebrate the Passover, a spiritual event in which Israel remembers what Yahweh did for them as they left Egypt that night. The Passover. 
Two interesting things. Men dressed for battle, take off your clothes and be circumcised. Celebrate the Passover to me in humility. I am the Savior. I am the Deliverer. And that's what he had him do in Joshua chapter 5. He wanted them to focus on him. You turn all your attentions on me. Lean not on your own understandings. I know what I've done. I know I dried up the river. I know I've terrified the kings before you just like I said I would. But I'm interested in spiritual life. I'm not just interested in you going and having military battle and taking over the land. We're going to do this right. And right is by focusing on God, on His power, on His provision of the land, of everything, and focus on His faithfulness to His promises. I mean, this is the Abrahamic promise being lived out in the lives of these Jews. They are walking into the land two million strong. That is the Abrahamic promise. Verse 2 At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make for yourself flint knives, knives out of stone, and circumcise again the sons of Israel the second time. Now, Yahweh's not telling Joshua to re-circumcise someone who's already been circumcised. That is a physical impossibility. What he is saying is he's commanding the sons that were born over the last 40 years while Israel wandered in the wilderness... Those need to be circumcised. The second generation of men who aren't circumcised. In verse 3 it says, So Joshua made himself flint knives. He did what God said. Remember who Joshua is. He's a military commander about to lead men into battle. And what has he just agreed to do to his army? Destroy them for a week. But he didn't ask any questions. He went, and fought, he went and found sharp rocks and he did what God said. He didn't ask a single question. Obedience. Immediate obedience. God, your way is perfect, not mine. Immediate obedience. Joshua made himself flint knives and he circumcised the sons of Israel at Gibeath Harlot. Now again, remember the scene. Israel's crossed the river Jordan. In battle array, they're ready to fight. God has stopped them in their tracks with these two spiritual needs, circumcision and the Passover. And as a military general, why would Joshua possibly have been uneasy? I tell you, he had no hesitation in obeying God, but why would he maybe have been at least a tiny bit uneasy? He wasn't disobedient, but maybe a little bit uneasy. Why is that? Because he's a commander of an army, and God has just said, make your army ineffective. Make, put yourselves in the most vulnerable position you could possibly be in as men. Make yourselves completely uh, subjected to the attack of the enemy. I can protect you. I will protect you. It's an astounding thing when you stop and pick it apart what Joshua, the leader of men, the leader of an army of men, is doing before Yahweh in destroying his army. Now he's got a bunch of men who need a bunch of wives to take care of them and a bunch of mothers to nurse their sons back to health for a week. The women are in charge for a week. The men are laid out. An astounding bit of understanding. It just goes back to, to Proverbs 3. Don't lean on your own understanding. Of everything that Joshua would have known as a man, this would have been the very last thing that he would have ever expected God to do was to destroy my army for a week. But yet that's exactly what God did. Exactly what God did. Remember what it means to fear the Lord? To fear God? We see a perfect illustration of a leader in Joshua 
perfectly fearing God, to reverence Him, God, as sovereign, the one who exer- exercises supreme authority. There's no back and forth between Joshua and God here. There's no negotiation. Lord, can we do this after the battle? Or You know what question I would have asked? Why didn't we do this on the other side of the river where it was safe? You've driven us across the river in battle array. If I was another man, if I was a man in the city of Jericho and I see an army coming after me, only two things. Number one, I put down my arms and and let you kill me. Or number two, I pick up arms to kill you. You've let us cross the river. We're two miles from the walls of Jericho. And this is what you want me to do. There's no negotiation. Joshua immediately does what God wants him to do because he exercises or or he understands who the authority in the situation is, and that's God himself. Only God has the right to rule his creation, including mankind, including Israel, including Joshua's army, and including Joshua. What else does it mean? It means to trust him implicitly. Joshua didn't ask any questions. Even like, his, uh, even like the man who came before him, Moses, but I'm not a man with a silver tongue. I, I have a slow tongue. I can't do this. I can't do that. Lord, can't you pick anybody else? Joshua didn't ask any of that nonsense. What it says is Joshua made himself flint knives. What a man. It means to obey him without question. Exactly what we've seen, what I've just talked about. And it means to fear him. I mean, if Joshua says, no, Lord, not today, we're going into battle, what has Joshua just done? He's cast off the protection of the living God, the only true and living God to do things his own way. And there's no way Joshua's going to do that. He knows what God can do. Look what it says as we continue into the, in the chapter, reminding or remembering that spiritual preparation is the most important thing. It's more important than any other preparation. You have to be right with God before we can have any kind of success in life. The same was true in Israel. It's exactly true today. You have to be spiritually right with God before you can have any success in this life. Joshua knew the law of Moses. Joshua was a student of the law. Joshua knew the law of Moses. And he also knew the command for circumcision. He understood what Leviticus 12 said. And Joshua knew that he must obey the law of Moses. Look what it says in Joshua 1 verse 7. It says, only be strong and very courageous. These are words from Moses to Joshua through God. Only be strong and very courageous. These are to Joshua. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses your servant commanded you. What was part of the law? Circumcised the boys on the eighth day. Joshua knew the law. Joshua knew that he had to keep the law. Because look what it says about keeping the law. Do not turn from the law to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. Joshua, if you don't keep the law, I'll crush you too. I'll pick a new leader. I'll pick a new leader. But if you obey the law... Remember the great Joshua. Remember what he says at the end of his life. As for me and my house, we will serve Yahweh. You choose, but as for me and my house, we'll serve Yahweh. That's the greatness of Joshua. Here early in his life, he's told, when you obey the law, you will have success. So Joshua understands the law, understands circumcision, understands these men haven't been circumcised. I'm sure he didn't check. But God knew that these men had not been circumcised. So Yahweh brings Joshua to circumcise the men. It brings up another question before we move forward. So now it says Joshua picks up the flint knives and he circumcised the sons of Israel. So the event has taken place. The army is ineffective. Why didn't the enemy attack? I mean, surely days go by, days go by, another day goes by, another day goes by. Why didn't the enemy attack? Would have been a perfect time to attack while the men of Israel are all on their backs, healing from their circumcision. 
And I'll offer according to the scripture that the reason these men didn't attack is because they understood God, Yahweh, had a special relationship with these people, Israel. I'll offer two thoughts, and then I see the word three. I'll offer three thoughts. There are three things here that are causing fear in the minds of the enemy nations. Why didn't the enemy attack? Would have been the perfect time. They could have routed two million Israelites. The armies of the kings of the Amorites, the kings of the Canaanites, they could have all come together. Israel is a tiny piece of geography. They could have made it there and assembled an army and destroyed Israel. Why not? They're terrified of this God and His relationship with Israel. Three things. Number one, Yahweh dried up the Red Sea for Israel and had them cross on dry ground. Remember when the spies came in to talk to Rahab. Rahab said, we know, we have heard how Yahweh dried up the Red Sea for Israel and had you cross on dry ground and were terrified of it. The other thing, they understood that Yahweh utterly destroyed two kingdoms for Israel. Sihon and Og were the names of the kings, and Rahab also tells them, we know, we have heard, we saw what you did to these kingdoms who were much stronger than you. Established kingdoms. And your God destroyed them before you. And the third thing, what we just saw is Yahweh dried up the Jordan River for Israel to cross on dry ground. Look what we have in common in here in, in all of these phrases. Yahweh doing something for Israel. See, this is a special relationship between a God and His people. The Canaanites had their God Baal. He didn't do anything for them. The Amorites had their gods, Chemosh, Astra, the, the Astropoles, and all the rest of them. I could name gods, uh, Milcom. They didn't do anything for them. There was no great sign of strength that their gods had done for them. But we see three times Yahweh doing something for Israel, something miraculous, something that has never taken place on earth. Three times. And because of these three times, the people in the land realize that the relationship, we would do well as Americans to realize this, that the relationship between Yahweh and Israel caused Israel's enemies, and thus Yahweh's enemies, to melt in fear. That's what the book says. They melted in fear before Israel because of their relationship with their God Yahweh. Look at how this God is rolling out the red carpet before you everywhere you go. This has never happened in the history of the world. And they knew it, and they were terrified. They wouldn't dare come against Yahweh and this, these people Israel. I wonder how long the people of Jericho would have waited in fear of God. They waited days, maybe a week. They waited another week while the sons of Israel crossed around Jericho, did the circle around Jericho for seven days. I wonder how long they would have waited before they attacked. I wonder if they would have waited indefinitely because the fear of Yahweh had stirred them, had melted them. They did not want to fight these people and their God. But again, from a human general's viewpoint, this would have been the best time to attack would have been the best time to attack when the enemy is, as, as far as Israel goes, when the enemy is laid low and Im impossible for them to fight, and as from Israel's viewpoint, to attack when the enemy's afraid. But again, I show you this again one more time. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, My thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. So it seems like it's right, but God's in control of these things. And so it didn't happen. So Yahweh is calling for a renewed relationship with the second generation of Jewish men before He will lead them into battle. Renewed covenant relationship before we take another step. I love that He's brought them across the river. What a gutsy move on God's part. We're in the land now. 
and now we'll renew the relationship. What, what a, what just a gutsy, gutsy move. The omnipotence of God, the omniscience of God, knowing everything that's going to happen. Just fascinating story. In verse 4, it says, This is the reason why Joshua circumcised him. Answers the question, why weren't they circumcised? All the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all the men of war, died in the wilderness along the way after they came out. This was the first generation. These are the, these men's fathers, the ones that were afraid because of the ten spies. For all the people who came out of Egypt were circumcised. They were good Jews. But all the people who were born in the wilderness along the way as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. I gave you my reason for it because the fathers were lousy spiritual leaders. Who cares what the law of Moses says? I've been sentenced to die. Woe is me. So they didn't have their boys circumcised. For, for the sons of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation, that is the men of war who came out of Egypt, the first generation, until they perished because they did not listen to the voice of the Lord, to whom the Lord had sworn that He would, because they didn't listen to His voice, that He would not let them see the land which the Lord had sworn to their fathers to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So this was not Yahweh's choice to have all these men die in the wilderness. This, this, was, the, this was the men's choice. You did not listen to the voice of the Lord. The Lord said, it's time, Moses. Go to Pharaoh, tell him to let my people go. They spent time in the wilderness celebra- or getting ready for the tabernacle, building all of these things that God told them to build. After a two-year period, they went to Kadesh Barnea. It was time for them to go into the land forever. That was God's intention. But the ten spies came back and said, we can't do it. So God's uh, plan was that these men would die in the wilderness. His desire was to give them the land of Canaan 40 years earlier. But the Jewish men, that first generation, chose to follow the ten spies instead of Yahweh. In verse 7 it says, Their children, those men who would die in the wilderness, their children, this second generation of fighting men now, their children whom God raised up in their place, Joshua circumcised. For they were uncircumcised because they had not circumcised them along the way. And you can only paint paint, uh, point blame at the fathers for that. Now when they had finished circumcising all the nation, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. Of course they did. There's nothing else you can do but wait until that heals. Why circumcision? I say that there are two things that God wanted to do, two spiritual events God wanted to do before He led Him into battle. Number one was circumcision, and number two was the Passover celebration. Why circumcision? What was circumcision? It was a sign of what covenant? A symbol of what covenant? God's covenant with who? Abraham. Abraham. 500 years earlier, let's just go through this quickly. 500 years earlier, Yahweh appeared to Abraham and He made him a promise. A unilateral promise. A one-way, unconditional, guaranteed by God promise. I'll give you an eternal land. I'll give you, I'll make your seed as numerous as the sand of the seashore, the dust of the earth, the stars of the heavens. And the third thing, I will bless you, Israel. I'll not only bless you, but through you, I'll bless the entire world. That was what God told Abraham 500 years earlier. And the sign of this, these promises, the land, seed, and blessing, the sign that God, Yahweh, had entered into a contract with Abraham was that Abraham would be circumcised. And everybody who was a member of this contract or this covenant 
every male would be circumcised. That was the sign of the contract. It was the, the, the symbol, the outward symbol of the agreement God had made with Abraham. That's what circumcision was. So let's look at it one thing at a time, an everlasting possession of the promised land. That's why we call it the promised land, because God promised Abraham in the Abrahamic covenant, I'm going to give you this land. You and your descendants after you will live in this land forever. Everlasting. An everlasting possession of the promised land. That's the Abrahamic covenant. What else? An everlasting continuation of Abraham's seed, the Jews. How many Jews were there in the world when God spoke to Abraham and made this promise to him? One. His name was Abram. Abraham was it. What does God promise him? An everlasting continuation of seed the Jews that would come after him. An everlasting continuation. Of course, Abraham's wife Sarah couldn't have a baby, so it made perfect sense that God would promise Abraham babies after babies after babies. Only God can do things like this because his thoughts are not our thoughts and our ways are not his ways. We know that Abraham's wife Sarah miraculously had a child when she was 90 years old. What else does he promise? Blessings for Israel and through Israel for the whole world. The greatest blessing, of course, Jesus Christ, the Jew, the Savior of the world, born some 1,500 years later, 2,000 years after God speaks to Abraham, 1,500 years after Moses reiterates all these things to the people of Israel. So blessings for Israel through uh, blessings for Israel and through Israel for the whole world. So fast forward 500 years, leave Abraham and come up to Israel in the promised land. It's 1406 BC if you want a year. It's 1406 BC when Israel enters the promised land, crosses the Jordan River on dry ground. Pharaoh, the events of Pharaoh and Moses, 1446. Forty years later, here we are, 1406 B.C. And look at the Abrahamic covenant. Look at the promises God made Abraham. And look what's going on in Israel in 1406 B.C. From one man, Abraham, we have an abundant seed of over two million people. You see how God's keeping His word that He made to Abraham. Abraham, in 500 years, his seed had become 2 million plus. The Abrahamic covenant is being kept by God. This one-way promise, God is keeping it. And Israel is living proof. I'm telling you, circumcision was the perfect thing to do as it showed that God is faithful to the Abrahamic covenant. What else do we see in Israel in 1406 B.C.? They have just entered the promised land that Yahweh promised Abraham some 500 years earlier. God is keeping His promise. The Abrahamic covenant is alive and well. 430 years we spent in Egypt. 40 years we've spent in the wilderness. But God promised our father Abraham that we would enter this land and we are in it. Circumcision. The sign of the Abrahamic covenant. Circumcision is the symbol of Yahweh's faithful covenant with Abraham. It's the symbol that God instituted for human males, Jewish males, to be circumcised in the foreskin of their flesh to show that this covenant was made between Yahweh and Abraham. And Yahweh has kept His promise. Yahweh has kept His promise and safely brought Israel to the land. Why circumcision? Because it's the perfect illustration of exactly what God has done, exactly what He told Abraham. It's only right. Of course, it's part of the law. But it's only right that they be circumcised to show that the promises made to Abraham are alive and well and we are living proof. We are the Jews that have walked into the land. 
Not even Father Moses had the right to walk into the land. But here we are on the land. We must be circumcised. I could understand Joshua when God says be circumcised. I could see in Joshua's mind saying that's exactly what has to happen. It's exactly what has to happen. You faithful God, you. So that's exactly what it says. Look at the play on words in verse 9. Consider, I don't want to be too graphic, but consider what circumcision is. And consider the wording that God says to Joshua in verse 9. He says, Then Yahweh said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away... There's your word. Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the name of that place is called Gilgal to that day. Remember, Gilgal means circle or ring. Consider circumcision just for the moment. There's a dual meaning. There's a double meaning in what's going on here. There's a double meaning in the stones that are set in a circle. There's a double meaning in the idea that God rolled back the foreskin from Israel, from the Jewish men here, as He rolled back the reproach of Egypt also. You wonder what the reproach of Egypt is. There are a lot of different thoughts. A lot of different guys have a lot of different thoughts. But I wonder if one of these thoughts could be true, that for 40 years the Egyptians saw Israel wandering around in the desert and, and wondered had their God left them. All their men are dying. The great army is dying. Was the reproach of Egypt that he just took, sent you out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Could be. Verse 10 says, while the sons of Israel camped at Gilgal, this is item number two for God. Remember, I introduced it last week. God had them cross into the promised land at the Passover time on the 10th day of the first month. And that's the day that they're supposed to select the, the lamb from the flock, the perfect unblemished male one-year-old lamb. And so four days have gone by. The men have been circumcised, and while the sons of Israel camped at Gilgal, four days after they crossed the Jordan River, they observed the Passover on the evening of the 14th day of the month on the desert plains of Jericho. I wonder what the men of Jericho were thinking watching, watching all these events. So having just been through the ritual of circumcision to remind the Jews of Yahweh's promises to Abraham and that Yahweh was keeping His promise. Now they celebrate the Passover to remind Israel of Yahweh's great provision for them when He delivered them from Egyptian slavery. Because He's a God that can do everything. He's a God that can do anything. So here you are about to go into battle. You're looking at this city, Jericho, from two miles away. You're looking at the ramparts, the walls that seem impenetrable to you. And what does God remind them? I made a promise that I will keep. And I brought you out of Egypt from the strongest army in the world at the time, the Egyptians. I destroyed those men in the water of the Red Sea. And I'll destroy everybody that's in front of you in the land of Canaan. You see the, what God chooses for people to remember at different times? It's just a perfect scene. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land. What comes first? I love it. The spiritual provision, the spiritual renewal the circumcision and the Passover, the worship, the proper worship of Yahweh for everything that God has done for them. And what comes after that? The physical, the physical problem, the physical blessings. They ate some of the produce. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, was the first day they ate some of the produce of the land. Unleavened cakes and parched grain. So they ate the produce of the land, they ate the fruit, the grapes, the, the things that were out of the crop, and they also made unleavened cakes, and they had parched grain. What didn't they eat? Look what it says in verse 12, the manna ceased on that day. Interesting, for 40 years, manna in the wilderness, but on this day, God shows them, not only am I an omnipotent God, all-powerful God that will lead you into the land in military victory, but I'm also a loving and caring God who will provide for your every need. 
And I've given you manna for 40 years, and today the manna stops because you're going to eat the crops of the fields. Not crops that you have tilled, not fields that you have taken the rocks out of. You're going to eat crops that other people, that Gentiles have grown. You're going to eat from trees. You're going to pluck ripe fruit from trees that you didn't plant. Other people planted them. You're going to live in houses that other people built. It's a fascinating story of God's provision, their movement into the land. The manna ceased on the day after they had eaten some of the produce of the land so that the sons of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate some of the yield of the land of Canaan during that year. Just more faithfulness from Yahweh. I mean, we wonder, wonder with me, please. Do you ever wonder, ah, you know, the Old Testament is interesting, and I, I guess I enjoy going through it, but what for, really? Would we ever have come to understand, and could we ever have, could we ever continue to come to understand the promises of God and His faithfulness if you didn't have these stories? God is revealing His character through these stories that we're reading. These historical accounts. Got to be careful with the word story. We wouldn't know of God's provision. We wouldn't know how caring He is. We wouldn't know how long-suffering He is. Even as Israel is making the golden calf and Moses is getting the law a few years earlier, God is providing and providing and providing and forgiving and overlooking and, and the, that long-suffering forbearance. He's showing us who He is. He's also a God that keeps His promise. Again, while Aaron is leading the people of Israel into idolatry, what is God doing? He never, ever wavered from the promise He made to Abraham. It wasn't a, you know what, just for a split second, I should wipe them out. I should kill them. I should stop everything. And you say, but Rick, God did say He'd wipe them out. No, He didn't. He did not say He would wipe Israel off the map. He said He would kill many Israelites and start over with Moses. He was Jewish. God never said, I'm going to pull the plug on my plan to give uh, Abraham's people an eternal land and eternal seed and to be a blessing forever. I'm going to pull my plug on that plan. Never for a moment did God waver. And it's in these stories that we learn about the character of God. Why the Old Testament? Church, I'm, re I I'm, I'm through the pages of the Bible. We are all together being revealed the character of God. It's a beautiful thing the way He reveals Himself to man. So for 40 years we have seen, if you know the story, Lord, if you took care of the Jews for 40 years while they were disobedient to you, you will take care of me also, won't you? Yes, is the answer. Lord, if you provided for Joshua's army at the time when they should have gone in and it seemed right, but for some reason you stopped that plan from moving forward at that time. If when I think everything is a go, but you stop me, you have a plan, don't you, Lord? What's the answer? Yes. See, we can learn that from the pages of Joshua. We can learn that from these stories. How God works with human beings. His thoughts are not our thoughts and His ways are not our ways. He's the sovereign. He's the one who has the right to rule. So just because we have considered all the facts and think this is the proper time, God may say it's not the proper time. And we have to trust in God, fear God, obey God implicitly, obey Him without response, without a smart tongue. Just do what God says. And that's why we learn the Bible. Well, Rick, why the New Testament? I mean, I've had people come in here and say, yeah, I heard the story, I heard what you said, but I just don't see how it applies to me. You don't. How, uh, how could you not? I mean, we go through the book of Galatians. Why? Because we're a church that has problems. Why is that? Because we're a church filled with sin natures. Just like they were. We go through the book of Thessalonians. Why? So God can reveal His character while His church, the bride of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, is corrected for things that they're doing wrong. Why do you go to the book of Corinthians? 
To see the long-suffering, the forbearance of God is nothing old. It's still present. God is long-suffering. He gives chance after chance after chance. I always told the kids, kids, thank God He's a tomorrow God. This is Mr. King, what do you mean by that, a tomorrow God? I mean He's much interested in your tomorrow. He's much more interested in what you wake up to be tomorrow than your failures yesterday. God says when you confess, as far as the east is from the west, so far as He removed our transgressions from us. Paul says, this is what I do. I, I forget what lies behind and I press forward. Because Paul understood God's a tomorrow God. Thank God for it. Well, why do we learn these stories so we can know that fact? It's not, about, it's not about doctrine after doctrine after doctrine and truth after truth after truth. It's about who is this God and what will He do? What has He done for me? What does He do for me? And what will He do for me? And who am I? Who in the world am I to gain this favor from this God. And that's the word grace. I didn't do anything. I didn't earn it. I don't merit it. I didn't deserve it. And we learn about who God is and how God pours out love and blessing on humanity. So when we think, because sometimes we think, because things just go south, God has forgotten about me. Have you ever thought that? Ever. And we turn to the scripture and we see God never forgets anybody. God, God, never forget, God has never forgotten anybody in the Bible, any of the believers in the Bible. He says He'll never leave us, never forsake us. We go to that promise in the book of Hebrews so that when we think God has forgotten us, we can go to the promise in the book that says He will never leave me and forsake me. We go to the understanding that God the Holy Spirit resides inside me, that even though I may be having the worst day of my life, I'm a creature made in the image and likeness of God. He cares for me. He loves me. He saved me. He wants a relationship with me. And it's enough that I wake up in the morning because this God wants me to walk and imitate Jesus Christ so others in this world can see Him through me. And that should be enough that God loves us. I just get tired sometimes of people saying, ah, you know, Old Testament, we're spending a lot of time there. Galatians, spending a lot of time there. <clears throat> Come on, man. <laughs> Come on. The Word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow. If the Word of God can pierce you like that, you should know it. It shows us the truth of who we are, and praise God, it shows us the truth of who He is. Who He is is what's being revealed in this book. Who He is, and that He's worthy of our worship, worthy of our honor, worthy of our fear. <clears throat> Father.